Hello and welcome, Adam's Chosen Ones, to a special extra video to celebrate 50k subscribers, where I will talk about a few of my controversial opinions. I am very humbled by how kind and supportive so many of you have been since I started this channel, with next to nothing while going to school in Europe. It has been so great to interact with you through comments or while playing Fallout 76, and it is just awesome to be surrounded by people that love Fallout as much as I do. So before I begin, I want to mention something that is important for a video like this. There are always a group of people that will think the term unpopular opinion or controversial opinion means that no one else holds that opinion, and I don't think that is necessarily true. There will be a number of you that will agree with some of these, and if any of you agree with all of them, then leave a comment because you might be my long lost twin and we really should reunite. So don't tell me in the comments that none of these opinions are controversial because I'm not going to say something crazy like advocating for kidnapping Josh Sawyer and Chris Avalon so they could never work on another Fallout project again. So let's get to the video and hear the words that Adam has inspired me to say. Number one, I like that Elder Lions was a big ideological break from the rest of the Brotherhood of Steel. A very popular criticism of Fallout 3's portrayal of the Brotherhood of Steel is that they are such a large ideological break from the Western Brotherhood that it is incongruent with established lore. What made Fallout 3's Brotherhood so different? And why is it that I am not only okay with that, but I actually like it? The first Fallout introduced the Brotherhood of Steel to the masses and established in clear terms the group's history, ideology, and practices. Formed under the leadership of the former US Army Captain Roger Maxson, the nucleus of the group formed after discovering the FEV-fueled atrocities at the Mariposa military base. Formally announcing their separation from the US military, they formed a militaristic fraternal order centered on recovering pre-war technology, storing and keeping that technology for themselves, and studying, recording, and even engaging in their own research. Between their strict chain that binds doctrine, that enforces their rigid hierarchy, and the absolute focus on their goal of seeking out and securing technology, it made them incredibly insular and primarily concerned with the success and well-being of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood that comes to establish itself in the Capital Wasteland engaged in an expedition to the now defunct nation's capital under the same directive to recover pre-war technology. But upon arriving to the Capital Wasteland, and seeing the dismal state of affairs, their leader, Elder Lyons, decides that in addition to the technology recovery directive, that they are going to defend the people of the Capital Wastes from the super mutant onslaught. Their focus changes over to the Enclave once the Enclave explode onto the scene, seizing Project Purity and killing the Lone Wanderer's dad. But once the game is complete, the Enclave menace quelled, and Project Purity is successfully started, they spend a good amount of energy distributing the purified water, or aqua pura, to the denizens of the wasteland. Logistically, this is difficult, and it ends up being a very dangerous task as well, as the caravans are highly sought after and are coming under constant attack. Elder Lions' approach to governing the Capital Wasteland Brotherhood is a stark departure from the main chapters of the Brotherhood on the West Coast, and for that, it receives a lot of criticism from people in the community at large. It is a big ideological break from what has been established in regards to the Brotherhood, and I actually like that. And here's why. Any group of sufficient size with strict ideologies will invariably produce elements that either dissent on certain topics or interpret the fundamental tenets of the organization differently. The number of historical cases are just far too numerous to list, but think about any country, organization, or religion and to varying degrees, there is at least one element that differs in regards to the initial interpretations or foundational beliefs. Elder Lions is this very natural and organic effect taking place in the Brotherhood of Steel, and it gives us an idea of how the original goals of the Brotherhood can be interpreted in a different light. I think that it is more realistic to have an element of the Brotherhood, be it a small group or the majority of a chapter, break with the common Brotherhood beliefs. Not to the point of contradicting everything that the Brotherhood stands for and believes in, but rather interpreting their mission differently. Lions and his Brotherhood fit that mold well since they aren't abandoning their mission to recover technology. In fact, they're able to get Liberty Prime working when the pre-war scientists could not. They just have an extra element that believes that their manpower and technology should also be used in part to help the Capital Wastelanders because of their difficult living circumstances due to threats like the Super Mutants, Talon Company, and Slavers. 
It is also a prudent move for them, since they are new to the area and without any established stronghold, in order to help garner support from the native wastelanders and communities. I think it is also important to mention the Brotherhood outcasts that were introduced in the Broken Steel add-on. There are many that will argue that their inclusion was in direct response to the criticism of the Goody Two-Shoes Brotherhood that they showed us in the base game. And while I myself have not made up my mind on that particular matter, their inclusion is another good step to show the diversity in thought for the East Coast Brotherhood. Not everyone shrugged and went along with the expanded role to provide assistance to the Wastelanders. A significant portion disagreed with that and would be considered the hardline or orthodox Brotherhood members. They believed so strongly that Lions was wrong that they forcibly broke away and essentially started their own faction, acting independent of the main Brotherhood group to fulfill their directive. That is an added layer of complexity that is not only realistic, but also interesting. We are left to discuss amongst ourselves whether Lions' methods and ideology were the best for the Brotherhood, as well as the Capital Wasteland, or if the Outcasts had the better idea, which makes for interesting arguments among the fans, because fandoms, fandoms never change. Number two, we should be kinder to the hardcore original Fallout fans. A good amount of you will already be aware of this, but for those that may not know, there is a relatively small but very dedicated group of people who played the original Fallouts and, when feeling their most charitable, see Bethesda's games as fanfiction. No Mutants Allowed is the site most commonly associated with a lot of the OG fans, although really they are all over in the Fallout subreddits or YouTube comments. Enough time has passed from the good old days of interplay that the bulk of Fallout's fandom has never played the first Fallout games, and there are even a good number that aren't familiar with the lore or plots. So it can be easy for many people to think that these older fans are overly critical and bitter, and just write off both them and their critiques. Are they overly critical sometimes? Sure. But I think it's prudent to look at these fans with respect to where they came from, to understand why they feel the way they do. I think the most relatable way to think about it that most of us have personally experienced is to think of a band that you really liked when you were younger. For whatever reason, their music was important to you and spoke to you in a way that few others, if any, did. Over the years, the artists changed their sound to the point that they were barely recognizable and you find yourself missing their old sound, or the good old days when they were just breaking out onto the scene. I think this is directly comparable to the kind of experience the original fans have gone through with the Fallout series, and why they feel the way they do or say the things they say. The Fallout series was something special to them, which should be obvious by the fact that they still have some of their online communities chugging along all these years later, and the Fallout of present day is a good deal different from the original games. It is beyond dispute that there are many differences in past and present Fallout. Some of it is obvious, like the isometric versus 3D gameplay, or turn-based versus real-time combat. Some of it is not immediately obvious, like the artistic direction of the world, the narratives and creative decisions regarding the lore and factions, but the differences are certainly there. These fans defined Fallout by a certain set of criteria, and often loved the games because they were well-defined by certain characteristics and those things have changed or been replaced or removed completely, and therefore they do not feel like the modern Fallouts are the true Fallout games. Using my previous example with music, I am sure we have all felt that to a certain extent, and I think it is natural to feel either betrayed or just miss the before times. This will probably date me, but I feel very similar about Linkin Park, where I loved their old stuff and found myself less and less interested in their new music because it just didn't feel the same. It felt like a different band altogether, and I found myself missing the old music and wondering why they couldn't just throw together an album reminiscent of their old sound. That is how a lot of the community members feel, and if you have ever gone through that sort of thing with a band, book series, video game series, or TV series, then I'm sure you can empathize. I also think there is a decent amount of bad faith arguments that may come from a place of bitterness or betrayal, and I think it is important to go through the critiques and really sift the wheat from the chaff. Some critiques are unsound and should be challenged as much, but there are many legitimate ones that do not do any good to simply toss under the umbrella of they just mad. I think we should celebrate Bethesda's successes and encourage the constructive behavior, while also holding them accountable for the times when they mess up or do things subpar. I think that sometimes this element of the fandom receives some unfair treatment, but it is also important that the critiques against the modern games be made in good faith. Otherwise, those that hate the modern games and those that love the modern games will only ever be talking past each other and not to each other. Number three, I am glad that Bethesda acquired the license but I wish that Van Buren would have been made. Van Buren, Black Isle's planned Fallout 3 had a great deal of the story and characters fleshed out, 
and there are multiple ways for you to get a good understanding of what they had planned. Many of those ideas found new life in Fallout New Vegas, like Kaiser's Legion, and Joshua Graham, who would have been referred to as the Hanged Man rather than the Burned Man. From what we know about the game, the stories, characters, and the region it was supposed to take place in, I really would have liked to have seen Van Buren finish development and be released. I don't think that opinion is all that controversial or unpopular, but I think many people that share that same opinion about Van Buren would not have preferred that the series eventually be transferred to Bethesda, and therefore I am including this in my list. Explaining why I would like Van Buren to be made, based on the previous work of the Fallout creators and the surviving design documents, is pretty straightforward. Why then would I not only be okay with, but prefer that Bethesda take over the series at around the same time as they did? The answer, to be completely honest, is in large part selfish, and indicative of my video game journey, or really all media for that matter, and how it has changed with time. With how great the original Fallout games are, and undoubtedly how great Van Buren would have been, I would not have given the series any serious thought since anything not first or third person other than real-time strategy games were not anything I was interested in many years ago. If the main title Fallouts had continued in the same or similar forms as Fallout, Fallout 2, and Van Buren, it is hard for me to know when, if ever, I would have tried the series out. It is because of Fallout that I now have an interest in games that are outside of my comfort zone, and although it is impossible to say whether or not I would have eventually come around, there is a very real possibility that I would never have experienced the Fallout universe. I know that I'm not the only one in this position, and that there are people that were introduced to the series with the Bethesda games, ended up going back and playing the older games, and liked the older games as much or more than the 3D games. But wouldn't those kinds of people that I just mentioned play the Fallout games even if they were still developed by Black Isle and had similar style to the originals? Maybe. But for people with similar preferences to myself, there is a good chance we would have missed out on this series for a long time or in its entirety. I also think it's important to look back at the state of Fallout prior to Bethesda acquiring the license. After the release of Fallout 2 in 1998, the next Fallout game to come out was Fallout Tactics, which was already itself a controversial game among the fandom. Breaking from the RPG formula that had been implemented in the first two games, it was a squad-based tactical shooter with RPG elements, set far away from where the previous games had been located. Although I personally think a good deal of the Tactics lore is interesting and pretty good, it was not a great success and plans for a Tactics 2 were abandoned due to low sales. At some point in 2000, Fallout Extreme was concepted and planned to be a squad-based third or first person tactical shooter that would be released on the Xbox, making it the most deviated form of Fallout to be considered up to that time. The next Fallout game to come out was the legendary Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, which was the largest departure from almost everything the previous games did. Being an action role-playing game with a heavy emphasis on action and the least amount of role-playing yet in a Fallout game, it was also only released on consoles, which was a first for a series that had been PC exclusive. It also had a very linear story, changed the aesthetic quite drastically to de-emphasize the 1950s retro feel, and substituted the kind of music that had become so closely associated with the series, namely the Ink Spots, Louis Armstrong, and creepy industrial ambient music. Instead, we had contemporary new metal and rock, like Kill Switch Engaged and Slipknot, all the while doing the first product placement the series has seen thus far as well, promoting the real-world balls energy drink. In the meantime, Van Buren was in development, but by 2004, when Fallout Brotherhood of Steel was released, it was still not even close to being a playable game. Shockingly, a Fallout Brotherhood of Steel 2 was planned, and in the conceptual stages not long after the first one's release. Such was the state of Fallout when Bethesda acquired the series, a potentially masterful main installment that was far from complete, and a slew of games that moved further and further from the kind of games that the first Fallouts were. It is hard to say how the series would have continued had Bethesda not acquired the license, but it was not in a great place if you were a fan of the original games. In fact, the many different kinds of games that were made and planned to be made with the Fallout name is indicative of a studio that is trying to capitalize on a successful brand in a rather desperate manner. Which, looking back, now it makes sense given the financial situation Interplay found themselves in around that time. The Fallout name and series as a whole is in a place where it is well known and won't need to undergo the same kind of treatment it underwent in the mid-aughts to keep a flailing developer's head above the water, and for that I am glad. 
For this reason, combined with the 3D titles being a springboard for fans like myself to get into the series, appreciate the lore, and feel compelled to play the previous Fallout games to really understand the series, I am glad that Bethesda acquired the license. Again, I do admit that a large component of this opinion is based on pure selfishness, but that is often how personal opinions work. Number 4. What Fallout 76 gets right, it really gets right. None of the new titles are as contentious as Fallout 76, and there are very good legitimate reasons for that. The game's rollout and initial state was completely unacceptable, and a series of mistakes made by Bethesda in their push to release the game made those that had faith in Bethesda and the new game lose that faith, and convinced those that were already wary of the game even more so, convincing them that they need not waste any time or money on the game. Bugs would get patched, some progress would be made, but there was always some new big controversy, like Bethesda's questionable tactics when dealing with dupers, along with some updates that would end up breaking more things than they would fix. For me, I chose to give the game a wide berth until Bethesda could figure out a lot of the kinks, picking up a PlayStation copy of the game about 10 months after the official release. I was only able to play a little bit before having to get rid of my PlayStation, and therefore the only means by which I could play the game, but I was able to experience the game before the large expansions changed the vanilla game significantly, so I was able to play it when there were zero NPCs except for robots of course. I found myself agreeing with the widespread sentiment that lacking any NPCs really dampened my desire to pursue quests, since I knew the people that had left the holotape recordings were already dead, no matter what. So what is the point of rehashing what most people have already heard a thousand times and may even agree with? I do it really only to communicate the fact that I am far from a Fallout 76 apologist and that I recognize there are legitimate issues with the game and the way that Bethesda has conducted themselves, so that when I say that there are things that Fallout 76 gets right, that people don't immediately disregard what I have to say next. There are some things that 76 gets right, and a few of these things they get really right. Fallout 76 is one of the first 3D games that I will listen more to the ambient music than the radio, and I think the songs included in Fallout 76 radio are top notch. I don't care too much for the DJ for the Appalachia radio, but it's not her that prevents me from turning on the radio. I just really like the ambient music. The music includes elements of bluegrass, often using instruments common to the genre in the ambient music setting it apart from any other Fallout game to date, being thematically appropriate and not straying too far from what we as fans come to expect from Bethesda's Fallout games. Most of the newer Fallout games, I would not really be able to distinguish the ambient music between them if it weren't for the fact that I played them so much, but Fallout 76's is immediately distinct, and that is really cool. It really is excellently made and executed, and Ainon Zur, who did Fallout 76's music, absolutely knocks it out of the park. Bethesda's developers mentioned Fallout 76 would have a special emphasis on new and different creatures, and on this point, they absolutely delivered. Fallout 76 has an astounding number of new creatures, and rather than being reskinned versions of previous creatures, except for maybe the Scorched Beasts kind of being like Skyrim's dragons, they really make the world that much more interesting since you don't know what kind of creatures you are going to encounter as you enter different areas. Mega Sloths, Grafton Monsters, Sheep Squatches, Mothmen, Flatwood Monsters, Snallygasters, and Wendigos are just some of the most prominent and visually interesting creatures featuring in Fallout 76. I even think the reasoning behind why there is such a huge biodiversity is rather clever. The years immediately following the war saw a huge rise in mutated creatures that often resulted in the abominations that can be encountered in Appalachia, and presumably a good number of these species, if we want to call them that, died out over time, resulting in the dominant wasteland creatures that we encounter in all the later fallouts, things like Deathclaws, Yaogwai, and Mirelurks that for one reason or another were better suited to surviving in the wasteland. Visually, the creatures are very interesting. They cause combat to be somewhat varied because of different attacks and abilities, and many of them are endemic to certain areas of Appalachia that are very environmentally distinct, making the whole thing feel more organic. I would even mention the increased number of small, non-hostile creatures that are found in Fallout 76 here as well, since it is great to encounter animals who are not trying to kill you and it makes the world feel more alive. Not in like a lush jungle kind of way though. It stays consistent in not letting you forget that the world ended and with it, a lot of life, but that creatures in different levels of the natural hierarchy survived in some way, 
including the small critters that the larger and more dangerous species rely on to survive. Similar to how the ambient music really lends to an interesting and immersive experience, the world of Fallout 76 is top notch. The diversity of Fallout 76's world and distinct elements of each area make for an overworld that is unmatched by any previous game. Making your way from the center of the map where the environment is largely untouched by the apocalypse, which is a bit surprising, you will find the environment starts to change as you head north or south until you reach a ridge that lets you look out over the world and see a visually interesting and different environment, and you cannot help but wonder what kinds of different things you are going to find. Seeing the ash heap from the city of Charleston in the smoky haze with the huge mining machinery looming above the smoke makes you just want to run over there and see what is happening, after gearing up of course. It gets even better as you enter the ash heap and find fissures in the ground that are burning, spewing ash and noxious gases that make navigating the environment a different experience than anything prior. You get to experience firsthand the source of the flaming fissures as you explore mines and see that the coal seams that were mined have caught on fire as you work your way through the choking smoke and ash, fighting mole miners who were pre-war miners that have since changed due to being trapped inside the mines and becoming trapped inside their mining suits becoming completely dependent on them for survival. All of this coalesces into extremely and uniquely interesting environments at a level that I don't think has been done before in a Fallout game. The inclusion of distant weather effects and other things like blinding light when emerging from mines or dark caves or the blurriness associated with distance due to an aperture-like effect all add to the already very impressive detail that went into the distinct regions of the world. This kind of attention to detail bodes well for future titles in this specific regard, since when it comes to the world and environment design, Fallout 76 outclasses all previous games. Let's just hope that they are able to leave behind other, shall we say, less desirable aspects of Fallout 76 from future titles. Number 5. The old games should not be remade like the new 3D games. A very common thought amongst the fanbase is whether or not Bethesda should recreate the old games in a 3D world similar to the Bethesda developed Fallouts. I myself thought for a while that it would be really cool to experience these games in a 3D world, because for me personally, they are more immersive. I like exploring the world more in first or third person, and I enjoy the combat more as well, so for a while I also wondered why Bethesda didn't dedicate some resources to remaking the original Fallouts into a more modern 3D style in order to make them more accessible, but then something important happened. I played the old games. After playing the first Fallout games, I no longer held my previous sentiment, and there are a few reasons for this change in thought. The first issue has to do with the massive area that the first and second games cover. The vast majority of you know this already, but for those that don't, there are a dozen actual locations in the first Fallout with more in the second that can be explored in person. And in between all these locations is the overworld that can be traveled through but not interacted with unless there is some random encounter. Just looking at the map areas that are considered parts of legitimate locations that the player can engage with, it is an absolute fraction of the entire area. Some fans have gone through the trouble of showing the different games and the map areas for each game, so it's easy to compare the old style versus the newer Bethesda 3D games. The difference is staggering, as all the events of the Bethesda games take place in an area that is once again just a fraction of the previous games. All the locations, stories, characters, and random encounters occur in an area 1 20th the size of the entire map for Fallout or Fallout 2. And that's not even mentioning tactics. Whew, that's a lot of space. How could the first Fallouts be feasibly transferred to a 3D world like the newest games? The best attempts I have seen at this have been some mods that look to recreate the old games in the New Vegas engine, but even then, they have to use a type of overworld in order for the player to travel between locations and experience random encounters, which is a very important component of the Fallout games. There has been really no great way to address this that I have read or been able to think of on my own, and I don't think it can be really adequately ported to a 3D style without losing too much of its original essence or feeling a little too ham-fisted and clunky. That would mean that the developers would more than likely have to choose a single location within the large area, like the Boneyard for the first Fallout or New Reno for Fallout 2. But at that point, it's not remaking the game in 3D. It would be remaking a portion of the game. And is that good enough? Could that really work? 
I have a hard time believing that it could be done in a way that would make the majority of people happy, since remaking material comes with the obligation to preserve what made the previous game so great. The old games also have elements that Bethesda has chosen to leave out of their own fallouts. The fact that you are able to kill children is something that Bethesda would not dream of doing, and it seems like with the exception of Fallout 3, even topics such as slavery have been walked back in the newer titles. If the old games were to be remade by Bethesda, they would invariably lose a chunk of controversial material. I don't want to get into the debate about whether or not that stuff should be there or not. Suffice it to say that there are things that Bethesda will outright not feature in the games, will water down, or change enough to take some of the elements that make things so controversial away, or change enough to take away some of the elements that make things so controversial. To me, it is better to play the old games as they were intended, with all of the content that the developers put time and effort into implementing, rather than a picked over or watered down modern 3D version. Lastly, my final point relates to how players build up the game events, characters, and in-game objects in a different way than those in the 3D Bethesda games. Playing the old games, it is very obvious that there are many in-game objects, be they static or dynamic objects like sprites, that lack a certain amount of definition. Likewise, there are more characters that have no spoken dialogue than those with dialogue, and the player is forced to fill in the gaps in their minds. The combat will often have things happen in them due to the player's luck, or perks that impact the character's chances of catastrophic success or failure. And the player is left to imagine what exactly happened in the scenario where they suffered a critical failure, resulting in them losing their weapon and taking damage, or missing an enemy and hitting a friendly. Everyone that plays the old games fills in these details differently in their heads, and as a result, there are thousands of versions, if you will, of Fallout and Fallout 2. Similar to how several people can read the same book and come away imagining characters differently, or interpret dialogue or events differently, the way that the original games were designed lends itself more to player interpretation. Sure, there are voiced characters, there are talking heads that give us a good idea of what some characters look and sound like, but they are in the minority, even among potential player companions. I have a feeling that going back and filling in these gaps, like showing us what the Fallout 1 companion Ian actually looks like and sounds like, might cause a lot more contention and issues for those that have played the games than it's really worth. They are games from a different time, made by different people in different ways, and even though they can be a bit difficult to play, and the interfaces are very 1990s, the games are more than playable in this day and age, and if you are willing to give the games a solid try, there is a good chance that you will come to like them for the stories, characters, and events, which, at the end of the day, are the elements that make games so special to us. Number 6. I like the new power armors that are introduced, even though it requires some retconning, and I don't think retcons are inherently bad. Up to the release of Fallout 3, the history and models of power armor were pretty straightforward and uncomplicated. The US Army developed these walking tank-like suits of armor to give fighting units incredible mobility and utility for the amount of protection they provide, and the lore is very clear that power armor helped the Americans beat the Chinese out of Alaska. T-45 was seen as the first model to be used by the military, which then upgraded to the T-51B, which was thought to be the pinnacle of pre-war armor technology for a while. The Enclave spent their years hiding and doing research long enough to develop their own versions of power armor. That can be seen in Fallout 2 and Fallout Tactics introduced a very unique looking version known simply as the Midwestern Brotherhood of Steel Advanced Power Armor. Over the course of three games, that is four kinds of power armor, with two of them being developed post-war. Fallout 3 starts a trend that many disagree with, or are straight out unhappy about, and that is Bethesda's proclivity to introduce multiple new power armor variants in each of their new games. My controversial opinion here is that I actually like the inclusion of different models of power armor, and as long as their existence is not lazily justified, I am okay with some logical retcons to make them congruent with existing Fallout lore. Fallout 3 alone introduces two new power armor models, the Enclave Advanced Power Armor Mark II, which is very different from any previous models, and the Enclave Hellfire Power Armor, that is once again very different from any other models. They are both apparently post-war designs, and that is why they are used by the Enclave, while the Brotherhood sticks to the pre-war T-45 and T-51B power armors. But the game also has several unique types of armor, like the Outcast style armor, Tribal armor, Asher from the Pits unique armor, the Winterized T-51B, among a few others. This makes power armor a lot more interesting, and while I don't think that the unique power armor sets I just mentioned are all that controversial, I like that Bethesda is both creating new power armors as well as variations on existing power armor models. Fallout 4 started to rock the boat though with the inclusion of T-60 power armor and X-01, both of which made waves because the T-60 was confirmed to be pre-war, 
Due to the Fallout 4 intro that shows soldiers wearing it, as well as implying that the X-01 power armor was also pre-war, since it was on display in Nuka World, and it would be inconceivable to argue otherwise. The presence of these two models do require retcons to the existing lore, but when done properly, it is not the kind of retcon that really changes things or makes massive waves. There are dozens of logical reasons that would justify the existence of different armors, and logically it follows that the US military would have various models of power armor. If the military were holding trials for the next generation of power armor models, they would likely have held competitions between defense contractors in much the same way that they do when looking at a new fighter, main battle tank, or service rifle. That is not even mentioning that different branches of the military would be seeking out their own models and versions that were meant to suit their specific needs. Sure, some of these would not be made in great numbers, but the X-01 armor itself is not particularly common in the wasteland, so that tracks. The T-60 power armor is also very close to the T-45, and could represent a model of power armor where they were able to retrofit better technology onto an existing chassis, and the similar looks to the T-45 are an attempt to reduce the amount of retooling that would be necessary to produce the T-60. Think of the transformations the original M4 Sherman went through in the course of World War II, getting up-armored and up-gunned to the point where they were maxing out the platform without fully committing to a new kind of tank. But you're not here to listen to me give conjecture and justification for Bethesda and their inclusion of new power armor models, because the point I'm really trying to make is that the amount of variety that is provided with new power armor is a benefit that far outweighs any kind of light retcons that do not impact the Fallout universe in any groundbreaking way. I am okay with these kinds of retcons, where we get more choice, variety, or mechanics in exchange for subtle changes to the previous lore. Once changes get so large that it starts to impact the old stories, characters, or pivotal events in the Fallout series, that is where I start to draw the line. You probably noticed that I conveniently stopped the Power Armor saga at Fallout 4. And that is not because I think Fallout 76 will ruin my case, to the contrary, I wanted to save the best for last. Fallout 76 stands up, says, hold my Nuka Cola, and goes completely ham with new Power Armor models. In addition to all the variants from Fallout 4, we get new armors like the Hellcat armor, the Excavator armor, the T-65 power armor that are all completely new variants while also giving us variations of older models like the Ultracite armor and the Strangler Heart power armor. I do not doubt that there will be more to come as Bethesda continues to release content, but as long as the justification for these armors is logical and rather inconsequential in the scheme of Fallout lore, I welcome the variety. If you disagree, that is perfectly fine because it is legal for you to disagree with me, for now at least. And worst of all, Number seven, Mr. New Vegas is not as good of a DJ as Three Dog or Travis. The first thing I need to establish quickly is that I don't dislike Mr. New Vegas. I do like him. Just in comparison to the DJs from Fallout 3 and 4, I don't prefer him. He used to be in last place, but since playing Fallout 76, the Appalachian radio DJ Julie takes the last place spot for now. I'm not going to focus on her, however, since this is my controversial take, and I don't think enough people would find me complaining about one of the Fallout 76 DJs interesting or controversial. So now that I let slip that I do in fact like Mr. New Vegas, let me put a bit more onto that pile. I think that the voice of Mr. New Vegas, Wayne Newton, was perfectly cast for a New Vegas radio DJ that has the retro Rat Pack vibe going on. Additionally, the fact that Mr. New Vegas is an AI and not an actual person is even more appropriate, given that he is a creation of Mr. House, who uses robots and other automation to project power and influence in the region. It is doubly appropriate, too, because Mr. House would have control of this AI, allowing him to control the news that people are hearing, thereby tightening his grip on New Vegas. Why then, in Adam's name, do I still not prefer Mr. New Vegas compared to the other two after saying all that? I honestly don't exactly know, but it might have to be because he seems just a bit too professional. Three Dog is memorable because he has a very unique personality, and I would get a chuckle out of some of the things he would say. Like the line where he admits to not even knowing what a disc is after introducing himself as the Wasteland's favorite disc jockey. In a similar vein, Travis from Fallout 4 is a very insecure and apologetic guy who somehow landed the job as the Commonwealth's DJ. His awkwardness, terrible segues, and awful ad pivots make him charming, and it's such a subversion of expectations when it comes to DJs that I can't help but laugh at some of his lines. Nervous Travis is so obviously superior to confident Travis that I did his personal quest one time and will never do it again, but it is cool that you are able to interact with him in such a way that it changes the radio for the rest of the game. Mr. New Vegas does not have that same level of interaction since you can meet Travis and 3Dog in person, 
completing quests for them that are unique to them, and you can even kill them if you so choose, resulting in someone else filling in for them. All of this culminates in Mr. New Vegas being a great radio DJ, but not my preferred DJ when compared to the other ones from the series. Please, everyone, have mercy on me. Okay, lay it on me in the comments. What did you agree or disagree with? If you think there is something important I failed to mention that is persuasive enough to make me change my mind, go for it. I generally try to be less dogmatic in regards to art, which I consider video games a form of art, since I know tastes can vary so much. So if you lay out a decent enough case, then it could very well change my mind. And that is it, my friends. I will see you next week with a regularly scheduled video. Take care of yourselves and go forth in Adam's name.